It was a long journey, but he finally got there in the end. Held by legends, signed by heroes. Episode 36, The Road to the Majors. The hard road and the easy one. So let's hit it. The road, that is. Players take many different roads to get to the majors. So you knew it was a cutthroat business in a dog-eat-dog world. You heard the words, nothing personal, kid, quite a few times over the years. You spent well over a decade toiling in the minors, working hard, trying to get better. You've been on 14 different minor league teams and crisscrossed the country back and forth for years and years. The food, the motels, all the time in a bus on the road away from the family. But you made it. You're in the bigs and you're a New York Yankee coming up to bat in a World Series. Doesn't get much better than that. So that's one road to the majors, the long, hard road that many endure. On the other side of the coin, you have the pitcher in this story who took the less traveled, easier road to the majors, and whose entire career and legacy can be summed up in one sentence. He skipped the minors, played for one team, then went to the Hall of Fame. Too bad for the batter, because when these two meet on this day, this pitcher is having one of the best seasons in MLB history, and today, he's on fire. So let's hit the road and head to the World Series. Let's go. Harry, James, Bright, utility player, MLB debut, 1958. Played in nearly 2,000 games during his 20 years of pro ball, playing on 14 different teams in the minors and four in the majors. The Missouri boy was signed as a catcher at the age of 16 by Yankee scout Bill Essick. Trader Frank Lane, who was director of Yankees Farm System, took a shine to young Harry and put him on the Twin Falls Cowboys, Class C in the Pioneer League. Here's an example of minor league ball in the 50s. In a doubleheader, the umpires hadn't showed up yet, so 16-year-old Harry Bright was put behind the plate to ump. He didn't pan out in the Yankees system and in 1950 ended up with the Cubs, who sent them to their Class C team, the Clovis Pioneers, where Harry really shined, leading the West Texas New Mexico League with a 413 batting average and 19 homers in only 95 games. Two years later, at the age of 22, he was player manager of the Janesville Cubs and was the youngest manager ever in the Wisconsin State League. And no longer just a catcher and manager, Harry played wherever he was needed and also drove the team bus. The autograph and the thumbnail my dad got in 1956 at a Hollywood Stars game at Gilmore Field down in LA when Harry played for the Sacramento Solons. He played for them for four years and really liked the area and ended up living there. I showed that scorecard for this game on my Gene Freeze show. In July of 1958, the Pirates bought Harry's contract and a few days later, he made his big league debut at the age of 28. After being in the minors for 12 seasons, he would be a pirate bench warmer for three seasons. And after the 1960 season was traded along with Benny Daniels and R.C. Stevens to the Washington Senators for Bobby Shantz. Harry Bright would have his two best seasons in the majors playing with the Senators. But Casey Stengel would bring him to the New York Yankees in April of 1963. The Yankee skipper was looking for a good right-hand hitter to come off the bench, and Harry fit the bill. He would spend the entire season with the reigning champs and played in 60 games. Harry Bright's 15 minutes of fame came while wearing the Yankee pinstripes. Okay, now here we are at the game. So here's the scene. The World Series crowd at a packed Yankee Stadium. Game one of the 1963 World Series. It's the bottom of the ninth. The Yankees are losing and Harry is sent in to pinch hit. LA Dodgers pitcher Sandy Koufax has already struck out 14 batters and was going for the World Series record. Harry Bright said it himself, quote, It's a hell of a thing. I wait 17 years to get into a World Series when I finally get up there and 69,000 people are yelling yelling for me to strike out. Okay, now this is me talking. Am I missing something here? The Yankees are the reigning champs. It's game one of the World Series at Yankee Stadium. Harry's wearing the pinstripes. The Yankees are losing the game. It's the bottom of the ninth, and the crowd wants Harry to strike out. Wait, what? I guess there was a lot of Brooklyn Dodger fans and Sandy Koufax fans at that game with it being held in New York City and all. Anyway... Back to the story. For over a decade, 
Harry Bright was grinding it out in the miners, being shipped all over the country for years and years. And now it all comes down to this. It must have felt like an eternity standing there at the plate. And with each pitch Sandy delivered, you can imagine the place getting louder and louder. But Harry does get the count to two and two. Then Koufax winds up and delivers. Harry Bright swings and misses, thus becoming a footnote in World Series history. As Sandy Koufax sets a new World Series record by getting his 15th strikeout and would go on to win game four to complete the sweep of the Yankees. And was the World Series MVP as well as the AL 1963 MVP. People remember a player's accomplishments at the event. That's why he receives all the accolades, and the guy on the other end of the event becomes a footnote in history. I say, better a footnote than not noted at all. Even though five years later, Bob Gibson broke Sandy's record and struck out 17 batters, a World Series record that still stands today. It didn't turn out like it did in his dreams when Harry was a little kid, but at the very least, Harry Bright can say he went down swinging in a World Series game against one of the best pitchers ever who was in his prime and on that day was on top of his game. And instead of being remembered as a World Series footnote, I'm pretty sure he'd rather be remembered as Harry Bright, the answer to a great World Series trivia question.